Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Freedom. Every week I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast, where we're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And you know what? If you've ever wanted to know what it was like to go from the military to multiple real asset classes successfully, then guess what? This is the conversation that you're going to want to listen to until the very last word, I promise, because today's guest not only got started installing critical source satellite systems, yes, I did say critical source satellite systems, he also had a stint in the IT sector as a consultant, and I think he did some other things that he'll tell us about, and then from there, he went full throttle into real estate, everything from single family residences to multifamily and to this thing called industrial in multiple states love that multiple states. And he also has an expertise in placing private capital. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's show, Mr. Darren Smith. Darren, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me on, Billy. Hey, man, this is really awesome. Love your energy. Love the pre-conversation. And I'm looking forward to you sharing so much of your knowledge with the entire Going Long family. So um, as you know, got to get into the first of the five questions that I ask every single guest. Are you ready? I am ready. I knew you would be. So help us understand, where exactly do you live in the United States, Darren? I've, I've lived actually all over the world and a bunch of different states. Currently, I'm living in York, Pennsylvania, which is about three hours southwest of New York City, closer to Philly. All right. Awesome. So uh, York, Pennsylvania. Fantastic. I think you're the first guest from York. So that's awesome. Um, help us understand also, too, Darren, what is the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? Uh, well, having a, a seven month at whole, seven month old boy at home, everything is positive with that. I, I love, uh, you know, just getting to play with him and interact all the time. But from a business perspective, the most positive, surprising thing I've happened had happened last 24 hours is a new mailing campaign I did with handwritten letters, hand addressed stamps on them. I put my business card in them and I have just got uh, basically a 10 X response compared to some things I've done in the past, which uh, is a great problem to have because my phone, I have about 20 calls backlog that I haven't returned yet. So it's, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Don't you just love when that happens? So make sure your phone's turned off now, because if not, it's just going to be, <laughs> completely, it'll be completely blowing up. And by the way, that means you're going to get even less sleep with a seven month at home, which is perfect, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> no, which is, uh, which is awesome. Listen, also to one of the things I do want to just say right up front is, uh, as you had, uh, active military service, I do want to thank you for the service that, uh, that you provide. Uh, for our country. So thank you uh, very much for, for that, Darren. Thank you. And um, listen, man, I kind of gave like a couple really high level talk po- talking points about your life, but I would really love for you to share in your own words, your backstory with the, uh, with the going long family. So they can understand a little bit more about like some of the specifically, like where you started, why you moved, some of the really major inflection points and decisions that you had to make to get to this point in your journey so we can uh, get to know you a little bit better. would love to do that, Billy. I'm, I'm going to start super early just because it influenced a lot of what I've done later on in life. Uh, dad was a civil engineer, so for the first many years of my life, we moved around every one to three years around the world, around the country, every time you finish a new plant. So when I graduated high school, first thing I did was go off into the service because I thought I want to go have some adventure, travel the world. And, and that's what I got to do. And fortunately, two of those years were, were stationed in Germany. So I got to travel all over Europe, uh, all over the, the world to some other places and had a lot of fun and have continued that through the rest of my life. So even, even to the point of being married, my wife and I have never lived anywhere more than four years. And I bounce around a lot, lived in a couple of different states. Uh, part of that was out in Colorado. And the real estate thread has been woven through that whole process. I started back in 2003, as you said, starting with single family homes, got into some multifamily and like everybody else did really well back in the 2000s. Um, But like a lot of people, 
I got hurt pretty badly in the crash. Um, thankfully, I had a, a really high level computer job at the time. And I actually uh, was laid off from that about five years ago. That's a whole other story. But I had built real estate up enough at that point that I was able to make that transition and go full time in real estate uh, at that time. Wow. So that's um, so that's really cool. So so you you actually had a, the, the chance at an early age, just out of curiosity, right? Because you said like one every three years you were moving because your dad like give us some idea. Like you you moved around the globe. Like where are some of the places you lived? Uh, we were in. Louisiana is where I started at and started where I was born. So that was the first year. I uh, went to Texas a little bit. Uh, then we went to Australia for about a year and a half. Uh, then we were in China for, again, about a year and a half. Back to, to Texas, Mississippi, Pennsylvania. And that was where then I finished middle school and high school uh, in Pennsylvania. And then after that was the Army. So back around the world again. Wow. So that's really cool. So do, do you have a recollection like of the time when you were living in Australia or China? Or was that just kind of... Like, do you remember things from that moment? I do. I was pretty young. So at that point, you know, it's hard to remember what do you, what do you remember from people telling you to what your actual memories are. But I definitely have, have some memories of that time, you know, outside uh, playing and doing different things. You, you have those those favorite spots that you like to, to visit. So I remember those. No, yeah. And I love that, man. And, and I'm also always curious, right? Because we moved around a lot when I was younger. We, we, although we only moved around in the United States, we went from Ohio to Colorado, Texas and, and, and stuff like that. But it just it. I, I believe that that has a way of um, really changing the way that you perceive the world when you're moving around all the time. And then the fact that you said that you and your wife and your family now, you've never lived in one place more than four years. Like, that's pretty interesting. Like, where are some of the other places you've lived as a family? Um, so a lot of it was in the Northeast. Uh, so Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia. But then the the big adventure for us was we spent four years out in Colorado Springs and Pueblo, Colorado. And that was a, a bigger shift just from the, the type of people and being out West. We lived in the desert. I mean, our dogs would get bit by rattlesnakes. I mean, it, it's a whole other world out there. Uh, it's a lot of fun, but you make a good point. The impact that that has of being around so many different cultures, basically my whole life has, I just love it. I love the, the ability to just walk in any place and, you know, kind of have, have no fear, just start a conversation, talk, talk with people and, and be open. And uh, it's made for you know, a, a very fun life. Yeah. It's, um, what role do you think curiosity has played in your success up to this point in your life? Oh, I, curiosity has def, definitely played a big role in that. I, I always love a new, a new adventure, a new something, but I would have to say the, the bigger thing that's helped me along is kind of that <laughs> helped in her a little bit, but not having any fear. Like if I go to wife and I were in a third world country a couple of years ago where most people would stay close in and, and me, I'm wandering the streets and going down back alleys and eating off of carts on the side of the road. And, and I just, I love that. So I take that same spirit of with travel and I, with a lot more caution, cause I'm, I'm partnering with people, but I take that in, in real estate as well in my investments. And I'm, I'm always looking for what, what is different out there? What are other people afraid of? What are the things that people are running from and how can I maybe take advantage of that opportunity? Okay. And that, uh, that, that makes sense. And I'm sure we'll get into, to some of that because that's, you're basically at the end of the day. And as you know, a lot of us that are, that are here are, you know, we're, we're in sales and we're solving very large, complex solutions many times for large uh, multinational companies and stuff like that. And it's about how do you solve a, a problem and how do you propose the appropriate solution for a specific context and situation? So I definitely want to get into that. And, and you talked about your father being a civil engineer and just out of curiosity, like, how did you even get involved in real estate? My dad, I, I think a lot like my dad in some ways, very analytically, but at the same time, uh, I have a much more creative side to me, as you said. So creativity and, and just being you're curious, uh, part of me. So the real estate thing actually was a coworker. I was sitting with, this was back in 2003. I just got out of the service, had a, a computer job, but I was, you know, do, really happy with doing great. And he was sitting beside me. He was kind of flipping houses and had some rentals. And he was at this point, you know, very advanced for, for what I was thinking at the time. But, you know, now it's like, okay, he did a couple of properties, but it was a whole new world for me. So at that point, just started reading all the books that he had, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and uh, you know, Millionaire Next Door, and all those, all those kind of ones that, and, and dozens of others to get into real estate and just started 
taking massive action. I was handwriting letters, literally myself, not with a machine like uh, like these days, knocking on doors, doing all that. Uh, did my first live in flip and did really well with it and, and kind of took it from there. Cool. So you're actually you're at work. You see this person, friend, colleague of yours that's doing this. And and for some reason that attracted you, like what what element of what they were doing attracted you to find out and want to move closer to the real estate thing? It it was a whole new concept for me, the making money by not trading your hours like, you know, being you know, my dad worked his whole life hours for money, you know, my, uh, being in the military again, hours for money, there was never that, that, that concept. So when he had a property and he was like, man, I'm making $500 per month between the principal pay down and the, and the cash flow on this property. And I, I visit it, you know, once a month, I pick up the check or something like that was a whole new concept. And I thought, you know, someday I, I love travel. Obviously I love being able to go and have the freedom of time and location. And so that was really the only way I saw being able to do that was through through having having assets that worked for me. Cool. So, and and I just want to back up a little bit because this is once again I, I want to. There are two elements that we've already talked about that there's just a pattern here, right? Number one, so you're in your job, you you see this person next to you, you're talking, whatever. However, that exchange happened over a period of time, and you start your curiosity then get you to ask more of questions you're starting to learn. And then this lack of fear is what pushes you to take massive action. <laughs> I'm, I'm describing that, but I'm wondering if that description feels accurate to you. It, it, that's exactly accurate. I just sucked every bit of knowledge I could out of him. I shadowed him. Like, he's like, I'm going to pick up rent tomorrow. I'm like, I'm coming with you. That was it. We knocked on the door, you know, picked up the check and walked out. That's all I learned. But like, I got to talk to him in the car and just, just absorb more of that. Absolutely. Okay. So you're just completely geeking out. You're finding out more. You want to be involved. You're taking more action. You're getting feedback, things like that. And so also too, one of the things that we mentioned is you start in single families, you then move to multifamilies and then you get to industrial. Walk us through that. I mean, maybe there are other things that happen, but talk us through that single family experience, what the next step in multifamily and then into industrial and maybe explain to us kind of why each step is, is happening. That's, that's an excellent question. I, I think the natural progression for a lot of people is you start out in a house. Everybody has a house. They know a house. Sometimes they're accidental landlords or they, you know, they can flip one property. They can understand that. Then the next natural progression is, hey, I've done it once. I can take that and do it multiple times. So the, the segue into, into multifamily is a very common one. And I, I followed the same path and I liked it. But what I didn't like about it was because it's such a common path and, and a natural one for people, the competition level in that was very significant. And to bring it to today's standard, I think it's actually, there's a lot of froth and, and a little bit of a bubble in that market because there is so much um, enthusiasm about it and, and people talking about it. I think there's some very good A players who are gonna do really well because it's a solid asset class. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to get involved in multifamily and I, and I love it for a lot of reasons. What I don't like is the competition. <laughs> and so the next natural uh, transition for me was, where are people not uh, talking about right now? Where, where are, is there not as much attention? And so I looked at retail, office and industrial, which are the other three uh, classes of, of commercial real estate. And I thought, well, you know, what do I, what, what am I the most interested in? And I, I can, there's a lot of steps to that progression. Progression, Retail is a, a great asset class. I'm glad I didn't get involved in that because of everything going on right now. Uh, that would have that would have hurt. But it's really complicated on the lease side. You have a lot of usually smaller tenants. Uh, you can get you can get crazy with with being creative on the leases on that side. And office, I just I'd worked in a lot of offices and didn't have a lot of interest in them. Um, even though I am buying an office building now, but that's a whole other story. But just didn't have interest. So industrial was was kind of where I landed because it was. It was one, it was a simpler. It was a lot of times you just have a shell and an office. So there's not, you know, tons of utilities, all these other complicated factors, uh, like in some other things. And also I like the people I was talking with as I started, a lot of times it's what kind of relationships can you build? Like that's, that's all you do with real estate. If you're buying a house, if you're buying a building, if you're working with a private money lender, if you're working, we wholesale properties. So if somebody's buying a property from you, it's how can you solve their problem? How can you build that connection? So there's a trust level and you can help that person get, get to their goals and their dreams. And I found with, uh, with the industrial class, I ended up talking just 
just to be completely honest here, it's a bunch of old white men, to be honest. And so yeah. they're like kind of good old boys. They show up in boots and jeans and you, know, you sit down at the coffee shop at the counter. And I, I just was able to form a connection with those people mm-hmm. and really find out what they're trying to achieve, what are their goals in life, and then how I can help them by, by buying their building in different ways, sometimes creatively. Uh, to get them where they need to be. And that was, that was why I like, liked about industrial. And I was really like owning it as well. I, I went to my first property, uh, industrial building. I hadn't been there in over a year and a half. And I just, I was actually going to another property. That's the only reason I even went by. I was like, oh, I'm going to be in the area. Let's stop by. But it is, it's a very easy thing to manage uh, and, and run very well with being hands off. So I think this is very curious, right? Um, I'm a, someone who every day I'm becoming more and more like a, a patterns and principles person. And so when I hear you talk about single family, <laughs> that's where everybody starts. Then you go to multifamily and like, it's kind of overpopulated. And so then it's like when you were in these, in the country and you're going on the back road where nobody is and you're eating off the, f- off the food truck and doing the things that most people don't do because they're afraid. Well, this lack of fear pushes you into an area where there are very few people, right? And, and you looked at retail, office and industrial. And so if you look at all those, it's probably industrial where there are the least amount of people. And here we we got our buddy Darren, or we have our buddy Darren, who's the same guy who's eating off the food truck and in the back streets and all that kind of stuff. So it's weird that you've just ended up at this place, right? Um, yeah, definite pattern here. So I don't know if you've noticed that, but me and the entire Going Long family have now recognized that this is a pattern. So, um, and most people wouldn't even like, so we're talking about industrial and I know you and I know what that's about, but we haven't really had that many people on the show to, to educate us about industrial. And so you are, have this very, very unique opportunity to educate us on exactly what in the world is industrial when you talk about it, who are the typical tenants that we're seeing and what is it about this place that most people run away from, but has really caught your attention that you want to spend more time and energy and even bring investors into this space. Oh, I love that question, but I, I could probably ramble on for hours uh, about that. So let's. Well, let's you try can't and- go for hours. <laughs> You're not allowed to go for hours. <laughs> keep it, keep it educational and informative. And it doesn't even have to be short. Just educate us, but, man. I won't let you go for do. days though. Don't worry. Industrial properties. I like to think of them as the, the ones you probably drive by all the time, but you never see them. They're, they're that, that warehouse that's on the side of the highway. They're, you know, kind of back in an industrial park where maybe you see the entrance uh, and it goes back off, you know, through some fields, but you don't, you just don't really think about it. You see that pretty high rise building. You see the retail center cause it's a, it's a, a staples or it's your restaurant that you're going to all the time. It's those things that you interact with. So that's another reason I like industrial, even less focus on it. Cause in everyday life, people don't, don't think about them, but they provide everything on the back end that you need. Uh, from the simplest one would be like a, a warehouse, just a standard shell, maybe a little bit of an office. They're kind of simple buildings from their construction because it's concrete pad, four walls, HVAC, uh, and that's it. And then you have loading docks and, and other things. So from a construction standpoint, uh, a little bit simpler. Industrial can get super complicated. I mean, if you and, and if you think about it, like a, 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 ga- a chemical facility and at the in the port where they're doing doing gas and oil pipelines and electricity and all that. I mean, there's a whole other world of industrial that I'm not involved in because that gets very complex, uh, you know, on a big scale. I like the more the manufacturing and the warehouse side of it. So one property that I have that I love used to be an old plastics manufacturing company and they have just tons of power. So that's another another feature of an industrial class. They usually need a lot of uh, power. They have airlines being run. So there's some things that get a little bit more complicated. But the businesses uh, I like going in because there are a lot of times there are businesses that like to stay in there for a long time. Uh, not quite like a restaurant where location is that important, you know, with restaurants, but for industrial, they have to kind of set up in there. You know, when they're when they're going in there, a lot of times, especially manufacturing, there's massive equipment that they're moving in, you know, that weighs thousands of pounds. So when they move in, they don't like to move out. Uh, you know, they kind of have their, their setup. Uh, warehouses, it's a little bit easier to move in and out. And so uh, those tents can be can be more transitory, but often they're not. If you treat them well and you you take care of your building very well, which which I do. I mean, anything needs to be done. LED lighting and we, you know we we take care of all that. Um, you know you want to do that to just to keep your tenants happy. And then on the small scale of it, one of my favorite ones is 
uh, small bay industrial. So what's small bay, if you can kind of picture almost like a bunch of townhome looking things, except it's industrial buildings. And they're usually like one to 3000 square feet, have a little office and you get a bunch of smaller tenants. So maybe it's your local handyman contractor who's out, out built his garage, you know, his business is too big for that. Or like a local delivery service where they need a little bit more space, a couple thousand square feet, maybe they need a loading dock. And I like those because you can diversify your risk from, you know, one building that's 30,000 square feet with one tenant to now I have a 30,000 square foot building that has 10 tenants. So a little bit more management, but, you know, one or two move out, it's not that big a deal. So gosh, I know I rambled on a little bit there and there's a lot of directions you could take it, but hopefully that gave you a, a good high level. Yeah, it definitely does. And I think just to make things very simple, it's usually these buildings that nobody is paying attention to. Like you just drive by them and well, you know, it's probably a warehouse or it's probably someone storing lots of different uh, chemicals or it's someone that is actually moving things. And I guess probably the thing that comes into everybody's mind is thinking of a very large uh, company like an Amazon or something like that, that is using a very large uh, warehouse where they're probably bringing in massive amounts of equipment. And I'm just using a, a, something that people can relate to as well, right? Because, and I, I guess I also think about it as a very similar way as major airports. Like they're very strategic in nature because they're a hub for moving things for either company or individuals or, or, or whatever, you know, in the airports, you get certain places and they're building massive, putting lots of equipment there. And it sounds like it's very similar in the industrial. So very strategic. Also going to assume that there is a lot of compliance, depending on which customer that you have uh, in your specific uh, industrial park or area. W would that be fair uh, as well? There, there definitely are uh, rules you need to follow, but really that gets into uh, the zoning. So light industrial versus heavy industrial and what's allowed in and you really want to be careful on that too, because when you sell a property, if they've rezoned, but sometimes when you sell a transition, so you're, you're absolutely right. You need to be aware of all the things that are and uh, and are not allowed. And I want to emphasize what you said, like Amazon, that last mile delivery has been a huge right now. So you can have an Amazon that maybe they have a million square foot warehouse that they put up, but in support of that, there's going to be a bunch of smaller companies who are supporting Amazon in there. So they're going to need the, the 10 to 100,000 square foot warehouse to support the bigger ones. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And so it helped educate us a little bit more as well. So now I'm thinking we have a lot of people here that are interested in uh, investment opportunities and they want to find out more and they're just, they want to get educated. Right. And so we know about the single family. We know about the multifamily because everybody's talking about that. We know about some other stuff because I do invest in a bunch of different stuff myself. And, and so help us understand, like, so you educated us as to what industrial is, help us to understand why industrial is a really interesting area to look for an invest from an investment perspective. One of the main things that drew me to industrial as well, and this is only amplified many times over in, in the new COVID environment, but everything now is, is based on delivery. It is, you know, every, you think of everything that's coming, you know, to your house to the point that they're even converting, you know, office and retail into warehouse. So what makes it so interesting from a from an invest, investment standpoint right now, I feel is while there's getting more and more attention on it, you're getting a lot of, uh, you know, REITs and, you know, funds that are investing in warehouse. There's still a lot of space left in it. You know, they're usually in the, the minimum 5 million, if not $10 million properties and more. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of room left for people like, like your listeners and myself uh, to get involved and still make a good return. Especially when I look at the cap rates, when you look at multifamily, I'm seeing cap rates. Uh, we, we could just, it's ridiculous how low some of them are. I mean, really touching like almost two and three and four in some of these tier one class A properties, but even class C properties in tier three cities, you know, for multifamily, they're bringing six and seven caps right now, which I mean that there, while there's some class A uh, industrial bringing, you know, the, the, the five to six cap in that range, most of what I'm looking at right now, minimum I'm talking about is like an eight cap and I'm buying things at nine and 10, 11 and 12. A lot of times where you can work out uh, even some type of creative financing them, or maybe they're holding a second after the bank. Mm -hmm. So just, you can have conversations that were a multifamily. They won't even talk to you because they just got a hundred letters in their mailbox last week, whereas I might be the only person talking to that seller. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you use some of those techniques for your most recent marketing campaign because it sounds like your phone is, <laughs> is blowing up in the same way. So that that multifamily knowledge that you've brought into uh, into the industrial space. Um, 
so yeah, so so that's really an interesting kind of perspective. So you're helping us understand some of the different interest in industrial. You've talked about some of the durability of the of the end customers. Uh, you've talked about some of the, and I'm going to use the, my own words here, some of the supply chain for maybe really, really large customers that also are in need of the type of asset that you can provide, which also is something that's interesting to look into if you're looking for different investment uh, opportunities. And of course, you have to be educated on it. So if you don't know about it, then, then it's probably highly unlikely that you're going to move in that direction. So the fact that you're helping us there is is a lot, um, is very, very helpful. Is there anything else that you think that I'm not asking you that you, that people just definitely need to know about industrial before we may pivot to something else? Uh, yeah, great question, Billy. A hundred things come to mind, but there's not one thing where I, I think you've done a great job of just covering all the different you know, general aspects enough to at least get people where they can go start researching on their own. If I had to say, I will add one more thing. Yeah. If you're trying to learn about industrial, you know, there's, there's literally a hundred podcasts on multifamily right now. There's zero on, on industrial real estate. So finding information out, it is definitely much more of a challenge. There's, there's very few books that are just on industrial and talking about that. Mm-hmm. The biggest asset that I found, if you're trying to learn is talking with, with brokers. So you got to find who's really the mover and shaker in your market that you, that you want to get invested in. And I would, you know, focus on one area. Maybe you're focusing on a certain asset size, a certain number of square feet, a certain type of industrial property, or down to like a certain zip code, county, you know, region, uh, depending on what you want to do and learn as much as you can on as narrow a focus as you can and connect with the players in that market. And that's how you're going to learn. You go out, you start talking to those people. Um, and that's how I've done done most of my learning uh, on the industrial sector, just following them around and, and packing them with questions, sending them properties, doing all that. Which I think is wonderful. And so make sure that you're taking action. Darren's giving you some extremely in actionable items. So go out and uh, listen to some of the podcasts. I'm going to be a little bit cheeky here, as some people would say. Um, but the other thing is, I think you may you may be giving yourself because you said there aren't really any industrial podcasts. So guess what you could be doing, Darren? Because it sounds like a lot of people would be very interested in you starting a podcast to talk about the industrial space. So no pressure, no pressure. And when you do it, you know uh, we we can talk about uh, how how you how we figure that out. <laughs> you have a skill set that I definitely do not have at this point. <laughs> <laughs> which will be which will be great. So I know you'll be out there um, helping to educate so many people because you're doing a great job here. And, and so one of the other things is, you know, I love this whole concept of long distance investing. It's something that I have been doing now for over uh, eight years. It's something that I'm passionate about and to the point that nobody else was talking about it. So guess what? Here we are talking about it. And you have a long distance story as well, because you mentioned before that you're living in Pennsylvania and York. Mm-hmm. Tell us kind of what happened in Colorado and why you still have this flourishing business in Colorado as a real estate business owner. Well, I, I, I touched on earlier how sometimes people become accidental landlords. I became an accidental, you know, long distance business owner. <laughs> I was living in Colorado at the time. My wife and I had moved out there for her to do a, a fellowship and she finished her fellowship and we just loved Colorado. We loved a lot about the state. Uh, a lot of the people out there were fantastic. So we stayed a couple of extra years. And I, during that time, I built up a wholesaling and flipping business and, and rental in the single family and small multifamily uh, industry. And so I built up a great reputation. I'd done you know well over 100 homes at that point. And all of a sudden, surprise, we're moving back to Pennsylvania to be back closer to family. And I had about a three month notice. So I'd build up teams, let go teams, hired and fired people at that time. But now I really had to get serious about how do you take something and scale it and automate it enough. So when that phone call comes, when that whatever, you can't run and go pick up those keys. You can't go to closing. I mean, it really made me get very strategic and and specific about how do I build something that I can do 100% remote. Like you're you're not allowed to do anything and you're physically incapable. And that took a lot of... uh, yeah, that, that was not that was not easy. And I even kind of went through even some more people after I left. But building the team, that, that's really what I want to get to is I am I have a phenomenal team that I built that still all live in Colorado and they I couldn't do it without them. They are A plus players. They allow me to do things that I never would be able to do. And what we've even taken to the next level as of last like uh, March, April, when COVID started, I bought a uh, Pennsylvania house flipping business and wholesaling business. 
And my team in Colorado runs my Pennsylvania business as well. So I'm running them remotely in Colorado. They're running a business here in Pennsylvania that requires almost none of my time. Um, I, you know, we have a, a you know, couple of meetings a week just to, to chat about once a month, I have to go to a closing or something because they couldn't work something else out, but that's about it. And so their ability to do things remotely, buy properties, have those conversations uh, over the phone, build that trust over the phone. Because when you're dealing with home sellers, um, that's a very difficult thing to do to build that trust. And they're buying houses from people over people who are showing up in person. And so that, that that's why I love about the culture of that company we've built where we truly care about people. We truly want to help them. Um, and that comes across over the phone. You, you, you can't, you can't fake that kind of stuff. And that's what is, what's allowed us to be successful in the two different markets at once. Yeah. And so I, I love this once again, because you are, you, you, you've gone long, right? You're in two different markets. You have continued to hire a players. You're continuing to get the right people on the bus as Jim Collins would say. And from there, it's also opened up new opportunities. I guess one of the things that also it shows to mind is your your origin, right, in single family residences. That's even serving you today, a number of years later, because although you have continued to move to industrial, you never forget your roots, and so you've understood the difference between that that investor, that home that home buyer, first time home buyer, or whenever. And, and it allows you to then build up your, your business and allows you to be wherever it is that you want slash need to be and still continue to build your business or invest where it absolutely makes sense for you and, and your family. And I think that that's a phenomenal example that you've just given us. And then one of the other things I think it's important to, to recognize is when you are far away, you can't do certain things, right? You can't just walk over and make sure that things are fixed because sometimes for some people like me, maybe that have to have a little bit of a control issue. If you're always focused on just that one thing, you're not really building your business. And so when you're able to then take a step back and really focus on getting the right people on the bus, putting the right processes in place and do that, then it allows you to experience extraordinary things. It sounds like you are uh, experiencing. In, indeed. You, you have to be able to let go. And that's, that is hard when you, when you, at one point we all did everything at one point in our business, we were all 100% of every job. And to let those go little by little, uh, it, it's difficult, but boy, what it allows you to do and, and the opportunities, you know, now I spend 90% of my time, 90 of my time on commercial and I wouldn't be able to do that without the amazing team that I have in Colorado. Which I think is fantastic. And you talk about your team. And so part of the like whole thing with the Going Long podcast is, you know, some people decide by choice that we're going to invest long distance. Like I love living here and um, I invest exclusively, at least as of today, back in the United States. Um, and then sometimes it happens by accident, like life events could happen or you decided, you know, you got a, a 90 day notice and you were now living back in Pennsylvania again. But you made a choice like because you decided that you wanted to keep your business and continue to pour your energy, your effort, your capital in to make that grow. I'm sure that that was something that you didn't. There was a decision that you didn't take lightly. But maybe if you could talk us through kind of why you made the decision or how you came about making the decision that keeping this business that you'd built was the right thing for you and, and your family, just with the hopes of being able to help a number of other people that are here or the going along family that may come across a similar situation. Well, that that's a really uh, a great question and a, a, a deep one, because you're right. There were a lot of thought that went into that. And while while I did make the decision, I'll say fairly quickly, it, it was one that I, I didn't deliberate on it long. It was, it was, it was tough and a lot went into it. And most of the, most of the ideas that I have, most of the things I'm able to do are things that I've learned from other people. They're things I'm, I'm in mastermind and coaches. It's, you know, I'm, nobody is as an Island. And so what allowed me to do that was, was the people that I'd surrounded myself with who I've seen do it. I've seen them operate businesses in other states. Maybe they started a new market and they opened up in a new one. So the, just the idea that it was possible, you know, just like when we went back to the idea of making money with money or making money with not treating dollars for hours was, was new to me. I was exposed to that from other people. The second thing is I have, I have a, a business coach uh, that I work with who is, who's phenomenal. He helped me actually through some rough times in my business several years ago where I had to take everything back over and kind of, kind of build it up again. 
And when I talked to them about it, it was what had I built all the time, all the effort, all the reputation. You know, I, I, I knew dozens and dozens of people who had bought. Well, I probably had at least 10 people who bought over 10 houses for me at that point uh, before I left. And so those relationships were were powerful. I, I built a lot of um, reputation capital, I guess, if you want to call it that, in that area. And I knew I could do it. I knew it could be done. I knew other people had done it. And I thought, why not try? What, what, what have I got to lose? If I need to, I can start from scratch in Pennsylvania, but I'm going all in. Just like, you know, maybe it's a little bit of a no fear and a little bit of naivety uh, in my part, but I'm going all in. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep trying. Uh, and I did it. So, yeah, yeah. Great, great question, Billy. Yeah. So, and, and once again, I mean, you just hit on something and I, and I tend to repeat things a lot because it, it literally is about pattern. So we're seeing once again, like most that you could have fear for a lot of different reasons, but you made a decision. You surrounded yourself with the, with the right people to help to challenge your thinking, to help support you when you needed it to, to be supported. And, and ultimately it was about you once again, you know, you're walking those back streets and you're doing things that other people won't do. And, and it's the, the, the lack of, or maybe the recognition of fear. And in spite of that fear continued to push through. And, and I think that that's something that's really important, especially when you're looking at, uh, you know, cause investing long distance is not something that is just easy, like 95 or this is just me making up my own numbers here. But, um, you know, the, the largest part of society is just going to invest in their backyard. They're going to do what's easy. Um, but the fact that you're investing your time, your energy and sharing your story with us, um, that's very, very helpful because many of us, you know, we, we believe well, sometimes are maybe a little bit afraid. And when we hear stories like yours, you help us to recognize that, hey, look, you know, it is possible. Just like someone else did that for you, you're now paying that forward and, and helping uh, me and the entire Going Long family realize that uh, this is something that's absolutely possible because Darren did it. So you, you definitely can do it remotely. I, if somebody's just getting started out, I would advise starting locally because some of the problems you can you can experience, you're going to solve them a lot quicker when you're nearby. But once you've once you've learned a couple of things, made some connections, then Definitely. There's no reason you can't invest anywhere in the country or in the world. Yeah. And I'm going to add, I'm going to just build on that just a little bit. And I'll, and I'll say it from this perspective, because I have never, ever been in the same city of any of the properties in my entire portfolio ever. Wow. Right. Because I've always lived in Europe and my portfolio is a hundred percent in, in the United States as of today. What I want everyone to understand, Darren, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but, but even if you are like, I think the point here is not to be afraid to get someone to help you through the process, a coach, a uh, a mentor, whatever the case may be, because maybe your situation, maybe you're sitting in Brussels and you know that you want to invest in the United States and it's not realistic for you to actually be there, but you need to have somebody in that particular location that can help walk you through that. Or you need to be in touch with someone who has actually built businesses remotely and understands like who are the different people that you need on your team that whether they be locally or remotely to make sure that you minimize the amount of risk so that you can improve your probability of success. So, and I, I know it's similar to what you said, but I just want people to understand like if, if your situation won't allow you to physically be there, you must set up a system that makes sure that someone is in that particular location that can help you or someone who's done it before can really help walk you through that, hold your hand. Would, would, would that be, yeah. would that yeah, sound I, fair, accurate? I, I couldn't agree with you more, Billy, on that. You're, you're, you're right. It, that's probably a little bit of a self-limiting belief that I was sharing there um, by saying, hey, start local, start that small. Because yeah, there's no reason if you have somebody local, somebody with experience, somebody that, that mentor to, to guide you through that process, either in that asset class or that location, there's no reason you couldn't, you couldn't start somewhere else. And, and maybe, maybe just start a little bit smaller. If you're going remote or, you know, start out something that you're comfortable with, yeah. where you can learn that process in that area, just like you would locally and then grow from there. Yeah, exactly. And, and the biggest thing, Darren, I don't know about you, but sometimes I make decisions based on how well I'll be able to sleep at night. I don't sleep very much, but the very little <laughs> bit I do sleep, like I need to sleep really, really soundly. So I'm not going to do anything that's going to jeopardize my sleep <laughs> at night. Good point. Good point. Yeah, I agree. It, 
it's one of those things. So listen, man, I, and I know, can you just give us a talk, talk a little bit about your, your, your company in, in Colorado as well. Um, uh, before we get into the lightning round of the going long final three, kind of tell us, I know you highlighted it a little bit, but I specifically tell us kind of what you, what you're, what you are doing in your company name, please. Yes. So my company in Colorado for home buying it is sell my house to Smith. That's the company out of Colorado for the residential side. Uh, for the industrial properties that I'm purchasing and now I'm a big office building actually as well. It's solid growth properties. So solidgrowthproperties.com. Uh, my team in Colorado, we, we've, I, I, I'm in a mastermind with people who have dozens and dozens of employees in some of their businesses. And we have, we've scaled <laughs> to some degree at some point, but then we've, we've leaned out and come back to our core. So right now we have three full-time employees in Colorado and then three virtual assistants. And we're intentionally keeping it lean. Uh, and may, we may add one or two more, but because we only wanted to focus on the things that that we just could be, you know, A players at and be the best. And when you have when, when you when you go mass, when you go to all these different marketing channels and when you have you know seven, eight, nine employees like I've had it at, at some points. Um, for me, it just, it got a little bit too crazy. I mean, there's people that manage that really well, but it wasn't my thing. So I would say we are absolutely, I have the people in all of the positions that I have right now are way better at what they do than I ever was in those roles. And I love that there's, there's something about, you know, where they're, they're just, they're able to, to, to dominate in that way. And so we keep it, we keep it small, we keep it lean. And that way we're able to be very strategic on the investments that we take advantage of. We don't have to take advantage of every opportunity. We're not out there. Hey, this this opportunity came across. Well, we have to do it because we have a this huge payroll or this huge marketing thing that we have to to to, to cover. It's like no, we we can be very selective um, and strategic and only take the best opportunities. And that's just that's changed everything for me. Um, being able to do that, it's just it's a lot more fun. Yeah, man, I love that. And you know, you have to be able to be comfortable and clear on what is the type of enterprise that you want to be able to build. And so, not every enterprise needs to be a million employees or five hundred thousand or thirty thousand or 10, mm -hmm. if you have the right people on the bus once again, and it's two or three, it's lean and it allows you also to, to help make the right business decisions all the time, then you know that's something that is also another added advantage for your uh, employees and, and ultimately for your uh, investors as well. So uh, listen, man, I, I wanna keep asking you a whole bunch of questions, but the thing is like, we got to get to the going long final three, like the lightning fast going long final three. And the thing is, I never ask anybody to answer the questions unless you tell me that you're ready. So are you ready? I'm ready. I knew you would be. So cool, Darren. So the thing is, we started first with you. Uh, no, let me, so if you're watching this on the video, I got a little bit confused there. So if you are, um, we started over there with you in the, uh, in the US. And so now I want to bring it back on this side of the pond. And I would love to know what is your favorite European city, either that you visited, I know you lived in Europe and you've been to a lot of different places or still on your bucket list to visit. What is that? Uh, what is that city? Uh, I'll be a little bit longer on the answer is that that's such a hard thing to choose. Uh, <laughs> you're traveling so much. And so much of your, your quote unquote favorite city has to do with who you were there with that time in your life, you know, what, what were the things you did and, and the people you're surrounded with. And so I have some really special moments in, in a lot of European cities, but the one I kept going back to the most, uh, where I, I, I've been there probably about a dozen times is Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And just that city, the ability, like, I just find myself walking forever. Like I can't get enough of just walking the streets. And I know you can do that in, in so many European cities, but that was the one I, I liked the most stop in a bar, speak to, you know, have a share a beer with somebody and then just, mm -hmm. and then just keep walking. So oh, yeah. that would be your favorite European city. Love it. All right. Another vote for Amsterdam. For some reason, Amsterdam gets lots of votes. It's a, a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful city. Well, I love it. I, 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 I love it as well. No, I definitely love it as well. So the other thing is, um, Darren, you're extremely successful. The thing is that really successful people always make just one mistake in their entire career. In the, the oh, okay, sorry, I keep kidding that we're wrong. I get it wrong every time. I know the going along family is like, Billy, you get this wrong every time. One per week, it's, right? Exactly, like exactly. So the thing is, really successful people have these uh, learning opportunities, failures, mistakes, whatever you want to call them. But like, if you can think about what is the lesson that you think would be the most important to share with the going along family. One of the biggest mistakes I made fairly early on in my career that, that hurt me during the last market crash was uh, when I got it, I got into an investment and I knew fairly early on that it was not a good investment, that I couldn't trust the people who were managing it, uh, managing the properties for me, that it wasn't turning around the way I thought. 
And the, mis- the big mistake I made was not that I got in, although that was a mistake too. Uh, I wouldn't do that again at that, at this knowing what I know now, but that I didn't, you know, cut the investment earlier on. I stayed in it too long. I kept throwing good money after bad. And it was, a, it was an ego thing, to be perfectly honest. I thought, man, I didn't want to acknowledge that this wasn't working. And so I've been, again, as I said, I'm very strategic about the investments I get into now. I don't have to make everything work. I can, I can only pick the best ones. And now I, I love that I have that because I have less failures or haven't had a failure in a while. Um, but when I do get into that situation now, I, I'm much more aware of it and I don't let my ego get in the way. I cut it. I, I lose the investment. And I want to emphasize as well, when I say I, I lose on an investment, even today when I lose, it's me losing. Um, I've lost money on investments for literally just because they don't care. My private lenders or whatever, they didn't even know I lost money. They got every penny they had coming to them. Uh, they were they were paid in full of closing and I took the hit and moved on to the next one. Um, but I'm, I'm able to do that now and take those losses, make sure my private lenders are, are made whole and then move on to the next and don't let me you get in the way. Yeah, love that, man. And so, yeah, the, just know that uh, got to keep, keep moving forward. Don't just wait and wait and wait and wait. Take action and um, pull the Band-Aid off. So it makes sense. And listen, very last lightning round, Going Long Final Three is what book would you recommend to the Going Long audience today or the Going Long family? Uh, so, so many uh, self-help type books and real estate books, you know, that I could talk about that I've read. But the one that um, inspired me a lot earlier on was uh, John Muir's A Thousand Mile Walk to the Gulf. And for people, if you're not from the United States, especially John Muir was a very he, he was a huge outdoorsman, a huge environmentalist. And he had a, he basically was considered the godfather of the, the national parks here in the United States. What inspired me about that book was not just that he loved to be outdoors and be an adventurer, which which I absolutely love, uh, love to do, but that he took that and he was able to inspire so many other people by what he did. And to the point of presidents and, and congressmen to come out and see what he sees. He brought them into his world. And that is what allowed so much of what we are able to enjoy today is, is because of him. So it's not just that he loved what he did, but he could he loved what he did enough that he could share it with others. So, so a little bit like uh, what you do, Billy, you love what you do and you're able to inspire and share it with others. And, uh, and that's what inspired me about John York. All right. Perfect. So uh, a thousand mile walk to the Gulf. Is that right? That's correct. All right. Awesome. Awesome. John Muir. So, um, wow, man, this has been really, really educational. Um and, and helpful, Darren, the things that you have shared with me and with the Going Long family. I mean, even thinking about when you're, you know, at, when your dad is a civil engineer, you guys are moving every one to three years in Australia and China and different places in the United States. And it sounds like that pattern kind of followed you as well with your family that you're, you know, you've never stayed in the same place more than four years. And then um, as you uh, have had different life opportunities, you kind of learned from people that you were working with and got curious and didn't, didn't, weren't afraid of taking massive action. And that's kind of took you into this path called real estate. And then you went from there to single family and then multifamily. You realize, well, hang on a second. Let me do some stuff like I used to do when I was doing things that everybody else was afraid of. You went to industrial. You've now started recognizing how you can add value to so many other people, learning about this space, educating us. I think you even got a an idea for starting a podcast. And so from there, you've even had real life events that continued to like move you one place, but you've maintained a business and you've continued to have a players and, and been able to continue to attract lenders and and add value to other people. And I know because of the stories that you've shared with us, the experiences that you've had, that there are so many people that are part of the going long family. They're thinking, Oh my gosh, I got to get in touch with Darren. I know he told me a little bit earlier, but can you please repeat Darren? what is the best way for the going long family to get in touch with you, learn more about you and make sure that that like that marketing campaign that you were working on or last time, like you go from 10 X to 30 X. How can we find out more about you, man? I would love to hear from, from anybody, anybody your audience who just wants to learn more about a, uh, what I do or just has stories of their own to share. I always love to talk. My email is Darren D A R R E N at solid growth properties.com. Or you can hit me up on my phone. 717-356-0356. All right. Perfect. So um, we've got it all and we are going to include 
your email and number in the show notes. So feel free to reach out to Darren. He's given you the opportunity uh, to do that. Once again, he has no fear, <laughs> which I think <laughs> is awesome. And um, listen, Darren, I just want to thank you uh, literally from the bottom of my heart for investing your time with me and the entire Going Long audience today. It's been uh, very, very helpful and educational. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for having me on as well, Billy. Really appreciate it. All right, cool. And if you give me just like a couple seconds, I would like to just say thank you very much to the Going Long audience and the Going Long family. Uh, once again, for investing your time with me and with Darren today. I mean, wasn't he awesome? Like he just helped really educate us all in the industrial space, which has been fantastic. And, you know, he's given you a unique opportunity to go out and share today's episode with at least two to three other people, right? You can make that impact on other people's lives, help to educate them about this space that now you're finding out about and you're, ex you're super excited about and you're waiting for Darren to launch his podcast and you know and you're the first one there, share it with two or three other people. And then, you know, that way you're also bringing other like-minded people to the Going Long family. And that it helps us to continue to grow with other uh, like-minded thinkers. And, and it's just phenomenal. And at the same time, if you could leave an honest review of today's conversation, I'd really, really appreciate that. It's something that I go through each and every one of the reviews helps me to understand what is it, the things that you really like, would you like about today's conversation? What would you like to know more about in the future? What are you going to follow up with Darren and give him a phone call or send him an email? Like leave that in the, in the honest review, please. It's something that I definitely go uh, and listen to and, and take into consideration every single uh, week. So aside from that, I'm really looking forward to welcoming you back on the very next conversation, next episode. Uh, and until then, go out and make it a great day. And thank you very much. Freedom. Wow. Don't you love hearing from top-notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five-star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode, so go out and make it a great day.